sister, Sharon Eubank, has asked that I give a very brief introduction, and I may or may not be obedient. Um, we're really delighted to have her with us. She uh, was an English major, uh, as was her sister, Corrine, um, and uh, we spent a few moments uh, earlier this morning reminiscing about English professors' uh, uh, past and present uh, uh, and the influence that they've had in our lives. She served a mission in Finland. Uh, after graduating, her story is really uh, one of these great stories that we like to hear from our students, uh, leveraging a liberal arts degree into doing lots of interesting things, uh, teaching in Japan for an international language education institute, uh, working in Washington, D.C. on environmental issues, coming back uh, to Utah and uh, beginning a, uh, a retail store uh, that uh, specialized in educational materials for both uh, challenged and gifted students and uh, for their teachers. Um, involvement uh, later in uh, the very extensive uh, wheelchair project uh, for uh, the church that has worked with international organizations throughout the world to provide much needed mobility to tens of thousands of individuals uh, in many parts of the globe later regional director for LDS Charities uh, with special assignments in the Middle East, and then finally her current assignment as director of LDS Charities. I suspect we might hear a little bit more about uh, LDS Charities uh, today, but just in case, I thought I would uh, read a brief statement, uh, description of what uh, this organization does that I think ought to um, both make all of us uh, proud and maybe uh, committed to continuing to do our part uh, with uh, their mission. Sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints LDS Charities is an application of the admonition of Jesus Christ to help others in need. Jesus Christ taught his followers to give meat to the hungry and drink to those who thirst. His is a gospel that includes taking in the stranger loving neighbors as self visiting with those who are sick or imprisoned. He taught that we are to love and care for each other, with the, visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions, and lift up those whose hands hang down and whose knees are feeble. Services include fruit, food production and processing, donated you know, used clothing, employment, social services, the ability to purchase goods locally in many parts of the world. They sponsor relief and development projects in 179 countries. Assistance is rendered without regard to race, religious affiliation, or nationality and is based on the core principles of personal responsibility, community respect, self-reliance, and sustainability, etc. We're very proud of you, Sister Eubank, uh, for embodying uh, the values uh, that we always hope to associate with our educational endeavors at BYU and in particular in this college and extend to you, extend to you a very special and warm welcome. Please welcome Sister Sharon Eubank. if anybody is in this room and you think, well, good, that's never going to be me, don't ever think that, <laughs> because this may be you someday. <laughs> I am going to tell you a story because it, it embodies how I feel inside all the time. I was 15 years old, and my high school, some group of, of, of speech kids, went down to Arizona to participate in some kind of a contest. I had signed up for speech because I was so shy that I thought it would help me. It, it didn't, it was worse. It was, it was terrifying to be part of these things. But anyway, in some off time of the speech tournament, I had gone with some of my friends, and I'm 15, I'm a brand new you know, high school student, and so it's so fun, and we're, we decide we're gonna go out and we're gonna go to Jack in the Box, and it's one of our first times away from home. We go to the Jack in the Box, and I'm sitting across from my friend, Jill Hibbert, who at 15 was 6'2", and so of course she stood out, and, and I'm incredibly shy. But anyway, she's got her meal and I've got mine, and we're talking to each other across this booth. And as I'm talking to her, uh, I've got a ketchup packet that's like that, and I have folded it in half, and I'm pressing on it just nervously as I talk to her. And somehow, in a way that I don't understand the physics, I built up enough pressure in that packet that somehow it exploded. And it went past Jill Hibbert, and it went across the restaurant of the Jack in the Box, and it went onto some women that were wearing white dresses. And they were furious. I mean, they were just upset. 
So, you know, of course, I do what a 15-year-old do. I jumped up and I grabbed a wad of napkins and I went running over to them and I smeared the ketchup <laughs> down their, their white dresses. And, they, you know, they were, they were mad. So the woman says to me, she says, don't, don't help me, don't help me. And then as she stands up and she gathers all of her things and she leaves the jack-in-the-box and she says to her friend, I don't know how a grown girl could be so stupid. <laughs> and I think about that all the time because... For a very shy person, I thought, how could I have been that stupid? Who folds a ketchup packet over and then does that kind of a thing? But over the course of my life, I have done a lot of stupid things. And my, uh, the great thing about being a member of this church, the Restored Gospel, and about being, you know, in your 50s, is to realize we learn a lot from doing stupid things, and it's okay. There's enough mechanisms built into our mortal lives that you can get past the stupid things that you do, both spiritually and physically and socially and, and all of those things. So I share that with you because it's still a little bit how I feel. Uh, to get this award is such an honor, and yet I still feel like if anybody had seen me 30 years ago at BYU, it's the equivalent of spraying ketchup over something, and they would never have offered me the award. Anyway, I just wanted to introduce myself in that way. That's how I feel. I had a very good experience at BYU but I was still very shy. My speech sort of helped a little bit participating in those speech things, but not, not a ton. So there were times when I came to BYU and as I walked forward to put my hand on a doorknob, I couldn't force myself to go into that class because there were 30 people and a teacher was going to be calling on people to talk about there and it was just how difficult it was for me to be on a big campus with 26,000 people and to try and overcome that, you know, I was a very tiny fish in a very large pond. And yet there I was, trying to get an education, trying to overcome my weaknesses and my difficulties. And I wanted to be smart, and I wanted to be good, and I wanted to talk about important things, because I felt them inside, but I didn't know, really know how to do that. And I had some teachers at BYU that were incredibly helpful and meaningful to me. None of these teachers will know my name. Nobody would ever say, oh yes, 1982, Sharon Eubank. If, if I put their pictures on here, they won't remember me, but I remember them. And I'm going to tell you why. Many of you might know Dr. Marilyn Arnold. I was taking classes from her at a time when she was doing her research on Willa Cather. I didn't bring it today, but I have a stack in my bookshelf of dog-eared Willa Cather books because she taught us the beauty of this great writer that she loved so much. And she made me love Willa Cather because she loved Willa Cather. Not in an academic kind of a way, but in a very real personal way. And that has stayed with me all my life. I have read those books dozens of times. She also taught my American literature class. And as we were reading Walt Whitman, Leaves of Grass, the one assignment that she gave us was you cannot read this book indoors. <laughs> you must be outdoors to read Whitman and Leaves of Grass. I don't remember the themes and the symbols and all of that stuff that I probably wrote papers about, but I do remember Dr. Arnold and how she loved the subject and how she drew parallels to what else was going on in transcendentalism and, and what about the gospel and how those things meshed. And she taught me a way of, of bringing my whole life into one big circle so that it wasn't segmented, but I could holistically look at all the things that were important to me. And she gave me great love of those things. I appreciate her still. Dr. John Tanner, I looked this up last night on the internet, he came to BYU in 1982. Well, I had him in 1983, so he was pretty new. He was my Shakespeare teacher. And, you know, I had a high school knowledge of Shakespeare. But he started to open up these themes and make them relevant in the 1980s. And suddenly, I was hooked. I was just enamored with this. So there I am in the lab over at the JKHB with headphones on and I'm, I'm watching a production of Orson Welles and Othello and I can hardly go to class because I'm so mesmerized by this, the, the beauty of language and describing otherness and what it's like to have those themes that were written during Shakespeare's time be meaningful to a shy kind of awkward girl in a very big campus. I can remember studying King Lear and him reading aloud in our class, the very end, you know, the very most famous part, where the king says to his daughter Cordelia, you know, you are the one who has cause. And she says to him those beautiful words, no cause. 
that got inside me and it lived and it became important to me. And it wasn't because Shakespeare was a classic, it wasn't because of the great syllabus in the course, it was because of the personal feeling that John Tanner had when he taught that class. Third person was Dr. Bruce Young. He was my modern British literature teacher. And we had this big thick book and all of us owned it and we, we opened it up and one morning we sat in and he flipped through and he said, we're gonna talk about Cardinal Newman. I had no idea who Cardinal Newman was. But he said, how many people of, in the room know the song Lead Kindly Light? And I didn't, but everybody else in the class did. And he said, I want to sing that song. And so a cappella, we sang the song Lead Kindly Light. And he talked about Cardinal Newman's conversion and what it meant. And now every time I hear that song, if it's even in my brain, I feel the, the strands that come from a dusty modern British literature book and what that means in my life and conversion and what it means to change your life. And he opened up the life of Cardinal John Henry Newman to me. And so I always think about him for those things. I had marvelous experiences here and I could speak about a lot of different things, but I shared those three with you. A second thing I wanted to talk about that was important to me during my time at BYU was the friends that I made. Now that's true for almost everybody, but I'm amazed that how long-lasting these relationships have been. These are actually pictures of my parents who are sitting on the second row. When they were young adults, when they were in their early 20s, they became friends with a couple named Keith and Margaret Miller. That's Margaret Miller in the gray sweatshirt and that's Keith Miller with the baby on their back. And Keith and Margaret Miller were brand new converts to the church and they introduced my parents to the church and they, my parents became uh, members and active. And so Margaret was my mom's escort when she went through the temple and she was pregnant with me. That little girl on Keith's back was named Carrie and somehow, in whatever way, Carrie and I became roommates at BYU. We didn't know each other that well, but our families had known each other and we were the same age and uh, we became roommates. And my relationship with Carrie isn't just a great roommate story. I'll show you a picture of her. This is us as little girls in a rocking chair. That's me in the blue, that's her in the red in the middle. This is us as BYU roommates and that's my sister who's with me today. She was also my roommate. And that's Carrie just getting ready to go on a mission to Brazil. But as we had those experiences, as we studied things together, and we would stayed up late nights the way roommates do, talking about what was important to us. And we talked about our families and how we wanted to be like them and how we didn't want to be like them. And, and we both decided to serve missions at the same time. And I can remember she snuck into the MTC. I hope nobody's here that will <laughs> care about this. Brought me a pa plate of brownies the last night before I was leaving to go to Finland. And she just said, I'm going to Brazil and I'm so scared. She said, am I going to be okay? And I said, you're going to be okay. It's hard and you're going to be fine. We still are in contact. She has five kids and she lives in California. And the relationship that I had with her is long lasting. And it also gave me a great gift because it tied me to this part of my parents' story that I didn't know before. I grew up, but I didn't really understand how my parents had come into the church. And I learned to appreciate that gift by knowing Carrie Miller. And the gift that her parents gave to me because they weren't afraid to talk about this, this new church that they joined with some people that lived in the same apartment building. And so that act blessed my life enormously. And so it laid a friendship and a foundation for friendships that will last my whole life. And not just in a BYU kind of way, although that's great, but in, a, in an eternal gospel way that is incredibly important to me. Another kind of friendship that I had here, when I came back from Finland, I was a teacher at the MTC. And uh, it was good for me to be with that group of, there were six of us. We had all served in Finland, and we had all pretty much had the same kind of an experience. Finland is a difficult place. It's a hard language. It's a, if, if, if I thought I was awkward, this is a whole nation of people that made me look like <laughs> a, an extrovert. <laughs> And uh, we were all, but, but we all loved Finland at the same time. And we had an experience where a lot of people didn't join the church, and yet we loved our experience there and our testimonies had grown. It was good for us to be in that place where we were teaching other missionaries about grammar and language and culture, but for the six teachers 
to kind of bond and debrief. What did that experience mean for me and what will I do taking it forward in my life? Is, am I cynical about it? Am I depressed about it? Or is it, can I turn it to be something energizing and testimony building? And I give credit to the five people in that group with me that it turned out to be energizing and testimony building for me, in large part because of them. This is kind of a dumb picture, but it is a picture of my apartment when I was a student. It's a Christmas tree that my roommate from Oregon's family sent on the bus. <laughs> we went to the bus station and picked it up. We didn't have a lot of um, decorations. We used actually candy wrappers. We took the foil and flattened them out and also hung those on the tree. And then we painted with poster paint on the window our Christmas scene. But I put this here because it was in that living room that I knelt down and prayed and asked, I've studied about the Book of Mormon all my life, but is it really true? Is it okay if I, as a lifelong member, try the promise in Moroni 10? And would you tell me in a way that I won't forget if this is right? And in that same living room, I asked, do you want me to go on a mission? Because it sounds terrifying to me. And I don't necessarily want to go, but I have these feelings. And I understood about Revelation and what it sounds like in my personal head for the first time in this apartment when I was a BYU student. And it's a precious place to me. I love looking at that picture, not for the Christmas things in there, but for the echoes of the revelation that I received, maybe for the first time in my adult life, of what this sounds like to me. I like to ask people, what does revelation sound like to you? To me, it sounds like when a furnace turns on in a house. You know how you're in the house and it's quiet, and then you just hear a little as the furnace turns on. That's what it feels like to me. And I didn't know that until I had these experiences here. But I've used it a lot since. When I was a student here, and I probably saw it on a flyer somewhere, I don't know, but um, there was an opportunity for Elder Neil A. Maxwell to come back to the College of Humanities, and he, in not a nice room like this, it was a very crowded classroom where all the desks had been pushed over to one side. I got there in time that I stood in the back, but he was talking about why humanities is a good education and what it does in the gospel and his own feelings about that. And I was so impressed at that time. He was talking about um, that all truth comes from great touchstones of forgiveness and repentance. And I started thinking about you know, what I knew about Shakespeare and some of those things. Uh, he talked about everything that we learn encompasses gospel themes. And I, I thought about the revelation and, and how I had walked from my classes up to the Marriott Center where I used to park and I'd be thinking about my geology lab and the, the literature class that I'd taken and, and, and something in my own experience and trying to weave those things together. And one of the great blessings of BYU is that it, it provides this holistic education where you're not trying to keep what's secular and what's what's sacred apart, but you're weaving all of those things together. And you, he was a master weaver. He weaved all of those things with language, with testimony, and I felt that spirit from him and he was here on campus. The things that I just talked to you about became a pattern for my life. Friends, teachers, and revelation are the things that I took away from BYU. Now, of course, I took a transcript and I took you know, a degree and I took other things, but those were the things that lasted and made a difference to me. And I did a lot of things, and Dean Rosenberg talked about some of them. You know, I, I was sort of at loose ends when I graduated. When you graduate with a liberal arts degree, you now have to figure out, what are you gonna do? And everyone is asking you, what are you gonna do? <laughs> and you don't always know. But I, I went to Japan because I knew I could pay back my student loan and and it would buy me a year's time. But, and I learned a wonderful thing there about um, a, a, an Eastern mindset. When I taught in the school, I had a class of junior high students, and I would ask them in English, what is your favorite color? And they would all put their heads together, and they would talk, and they would consensually de decide, our favorite color is blue. And so for, for weeks, I was like, OK, no group thinking. Let, let me understand, what is your individual color? They could not answer that question. And finally, I thought, why are you fighting this? Why don't you embrace this, this very interesting idea that we are all one, and we are looking for something that we can all agree on? There's a beautiful gospel uh, 
principle in that, and it's this idea about councils and how we can all come together, and although we have individual opinions, we can come up with something that the council recommends. And I, I learned that when I was in Japan. When I left Japan, I went to Washington, D.C., and I was, uh, I, I, I was, in the beginning, I was embarrassed because there you are in beautiful Washington, and there's all these monuments, and people have gone to very uh, important schools, and they have very big degrees, and I was just a, a girl with an English degree from BYU. But as I realized there, pretty much the whole country's like you. <laughs> Most people have the same kind of background that I had, and I could see what they were doing, and they were doing important things, and I recognized you don't have to be smarter than you are. It's okay if you are the person who folded a ketchup packet in half and had that kind of a fiasco. There are people that are like you, and you can do things. And I got my confidence in Washington, D.C. People let me do things. They gave me assignments to do that I didn't know how to do, and they said, go ahead and try. And that was good for me at that time. When I came back and I opened up my business here in Provo, and if you're tracking my career, what do those things have in common? <laughs> They have very little in common. It makes an interesting story, but uh, you, you move from an international place to a very big uh, bureaucratic kind of institution like the United States Senate to owning a tiny little business where you and a partner can make decisions over lunch uh, and then coming to the church, where, which is a different kind of hierarchical bureaucracy. And uh, those experiences all strung together, although I didn't know it at the time, have helped me relate to different people in different situations and wear different hats for different uh, reasons. And for me, who goes from sometimes speaking at the United Nations to a very tiny village where they're mucking out a latrine, you have to learn how to adjust to different people. And uh, I've been thankful for those. So I thought, although at the time I didn't, couldn't really see the path that was weaving me toward the job that I have now. And I have students call me all the time, how do I get your job? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to get this job. But I believe that the door was open for me and an opportunity was made. And I'm very thankful for that. I recognize it wasn't exactly that I'm so spectacular that uh, I should be the director of LDS Charities. But it was the right thing at the right time. And for the time that I'm there, I can be the face of the church in different institutions. And then the time will be over and I will do something else. But what a great privilege it is for me to be doing this at this time. So I thought I would share with you at the last part of this talk how teachers, how friends, and how revelation are now applying in the work that I do now. So I thought I'd just share a couple of those things with you. This is a picture, and if you, if you remember uh, the talk that Elder Callister gave in conference, he referenced a little girl in, in Beirut, Lebanon, who was baptized by her brother. And he talked about how she learned the gospel from a family that were the only members of the church in the country where they lived under tremendous pressure and stress to not be members of the church. And I happened to be in Beirut last year when she was baptized. And so this is the Sarah that he referenced, that farthest girl on the right, and that's her brother, Durette, that baptized her. And they joined the church in Romania, and then they went back to their homeland, and they didn't think there were any other members. And so it was such a blessing to them when they discovered the branch that was in Beirut and they could um, cross the border and come. And this is their sister, Rita. I put this on here as teachers because it has been such a privilege for me to be in places in the world where people do not have parents that, have, that they even know sometimes or that certainly have stayed together. They do not have any opportunity to go to school. They don't, they are worried every day about food and safety. And sometimes they get food and safety and other days they don't have food and safety. And that consumes their world. And they have a lot that they are able to teach me as I sit with them because my life has been smooth. My life has been prepared from the generations that went before me. And these are the generations that are doing the preparing. They have a, they have a desire to do something and they have a desire to help their children. And their parents joined the church and have spent time in political prison. In instances, their father, he was in a prison where he wasn't allowed to bathe for nine months. Now think about what that does to just your physical person. And yet all of their hopes are pinned on this next generation. And there are millions, billions of people who have deferred their own hopes to the next generation. And that is a Christ-like, godly gift because Christ as the Savior deferred his own eternal life, I guess if you want to call it that, 
on our behalf so that he could do the atonement. And he deferred all of the things that we're working on on behalf. He is a God who understands deferment. And he is the God for these pioneers. And I learn that when I interact with them in the places of the world where there won't be a university and there won't be an intact family. They're not the poster children for that, but they teach me those great lessons. And it's, it's such a great gift. The welfare department talks about the beauty of givers and receivers. And all of us are givers and all of us are receivers. And that interaction, that exchange going back and forth is one of the most powerful things that happens to us as human beings. And if we view ourselves as a giver all of the time, we're not, we're not tuned into reality. We're not really noticing the people who give to us every day. And sometimes we have a, a preconceived idea of who can give and who can't give. And I have found that that just isn't true. You can never have a preconceived idea of somebody who can be your teacher. So in this day, Sarah and Durrett were my teachers, and I learned something profound. I have lots and lots of friends, and I could, I could show so many pictures on this slide, but I chose to show the people that I work with. These are people who, if you need somebody in a Haitian hospital after the earthquake to transport bodies because there's no gurney, and sometimes those bodies are alive and sometimes they're dead and they are dripping all kinds of fluids. But there isn't anybody to move them if somebody is who's strong. And one of my colleagues scooped up those people and all day long lifted them to a new place. And he said at the end of the day, his arms were just shaking. But I think about the metaphor of what that is, of somebody who can using their muscles to pick up somebody and place them where they need to be. And what a, a Christ-like act that is for spending one day. If you need somebody to reconcile horrifically out of balance accounts because we're using 18 currencies, that's Carol Billings. <laughs> and she sits at a tiny desk and she does that kind of work and it's her contribution to the kingdom. And she does it not because she's a good accountant, but because she cares about Zion. And this is the piece that she can do for Zion. If you need someone to teach people how to muck out pit latrines, this is Bozoba, Bozoba in Rwanda is our, um, he goes into the different communities and he teaches them how to do that and how to add the microbes so that it, the enzymes start to work. And, and we take this for granted because of our civilization. You know, our, our latrines are porcelain and they're flushed and they whisk things away. But this is a very elemental piece. And there are billions of people all over the world who need every day to think about this. And Bozoba does that training for them. This is an intern with us. She came, she was just like me, except she had red hair. Shy, awkward, difficult to talk, and yet uh, we gave her assignments and she flourished because she took the challenge that she could get help through Revelation and she would go and do those things. I so admire the people that I get to work with. In Salt Lake, across the world, they are young, they are old. There's a picture that isn't showing here, I don't know why, but it's of a it's of a 78-year-old former mayor who is in a chicken coop trying to figure out how to get those chickens up into the boxes. He's in the Dominican Republic trying to work on a food project with the, with the group there and trying to get chickens to do their roosting and nesting. Anyway, I feel such power from the friends that um, I give. And the ability to make and keep friends in difficult circumstances is one of the greatest opportunities we have as, more in, as mortals. And it doesn't really matter whatever your work you're doing. Whatever the work you do, this is, it's not just potential, it's opportunity every single day. And how we take advantage of that is really up to us. This is, I don't know if you can see what's going on in this picture. It was just taken about um, four or five months ago. I'm in Amman, Jordan. And the, uh, we have a brand new LDS Charities building. It's the only building in the world that we own, and it's in Amman. And we are just getting ready for the big open house where we have invited the royal family, and we've invited all of our uh, charitable partners. And it's a very big deal. It's a big deal for the church. And the electricity was turned on just before the open house. The open house is starting in about a half an hour. Well, when they turned on the lights, we realized up in the tops of those lights, there's all kinds of dead insects and construction debris. And we thought, oh, it's, it's not right. So we thought, how can we get those off? And there was, there's no, without uninstalling that light, I couldn't figure out how to get it off and wash it. And somebody had the brilliant idea, if we get a vacuum, well, there wasn't a vacuum. We had to go down to the next floor and borrow one from the landlord. And this is my colleague who has 
plugged it in in the next room and using a construction cable, and he's wound it out into the, the room. These brethren down on the bottom have helped me in my stocking feet get up onto the table. Here's my other colleague who's holding the canister up as high as he can, and I'm trying to vacuum out bugs as fast as I can before those elevators open and you know the royal family comes out. <laughs> This is a great metaphor in my own life of what friends do for each other and how we work together in the work. It doesn't really matter what your station is, what your calling is. In the extremity, we do whatever it takes. We go down and borrow a cord. We hold up the canister. We climb up on a table. Whatever it is that needs to be done. And this is my metaphor for that. This is an interesting picture. Again, I, I have called and assigned to do things in my role as the director of LDS Charities that are never comfortable for me. And one of them was in February when I was assigned to go uh, to the United Nations and give a 90-minute presentation about who LDS Charities is. So this is the picture of the room taken from the back. It's one of those United Nations conference rooms, and it holds 500 people. And I was you know, in the way that we do. I was hoping that maybe eight people would come. The room is packed. And somebody took a picture. I am sitting clear down there, and you can't even see me. I'm so small. But I felt small. I thought, what am I doing here? And, and what am I going to say that is going to be useful to these permanent members at the United Nations? And I show this picture because the night before, I mean, this was a big deal. It was a big deal for the church and for LDS Charities, and I was well prepared. I wasn't going to go into that situation without having every duck lined up and, and every piece put on a, you know, I, I was completely prepared. And so when I arrived in New York, I, I was put up in a very nice hotel across the street from the United Nations. You know, my window looks out over the, the river, and it was, it was beautiful. And I'm just getting ready to go to bed, and I'm flipping through my pages, you know, just trying to see how it will go. Very familiar material to me. And there's this, this niggling in the back of my mind that says, this isn't right. And I said out loud, please don't say that this isn't right, because I can't change this now. <laughs> I've done all of this work. It's too late. But I keep having this feeling. So finally, I said in prayer, what is it that isn't right? And I didn't get an answer. And I said, I need to know what needs to change, or I can't follow the feelings that I'm feeling. And I still didn't have anything. Well, now it's like 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking, what do you want me to do? I got online, and I started paging through stuff that I had, internet sites, just looking for something that might spark. What is it that's missing? And on LDS.org, the church history department had put up some, some thing. And it was about um, what happened in the Netherlands and Germany after World War II. And truthfully, out of just um, trying to take a break, I looked through those slides, and it just hit me. I could feel that furnace turn on in my body. This is the thing that's missing. And it was a story about Dutch saints who grew potatoes, and then right at the end of the, of, of the growing season, right after the war, when they had nothing, they were encouraged to send those potatoes over to cross to their bitter enemies in Germany because the German saints didn't have potatoes either. And they did it. They not only sent the potatoes, they sent all the potatoes. And, they, and the spirit told me, this is the story you need to, intru to introduce your remarks with. And I flustered, grabbed a bunch of stuff, and I tried to you know, get different slides and... This is the slide that I used. It was slightly fuzzy even then. But this is a picture of those Dutch branch members, and here's the mission president, loading all of the potatoes that they've harvested onto a train that went over into Germany. And this became the piece of that 90-minute talk that everybody wanted to talk to me about. Everybody came up afterwards and said, I was in the Netherlands, or I've never heard that story. And it energized people because it isn't about charity that is has... Uh, predictable outcomes or that uh, is, is an investment. It's about charity that against all odds people do when you couldn't even humanly expect them to do those kinds of things. And without knowing that, the Spirit directed me to that story and it became the right thing. I'm so glad that even in my frustration I found it and I was able to use it. And I want to give my testimony, if you want to call it that, that the Lord cares about the everyday things that we do. He cares about where we live. He cares about the things we say. He cares about our friends, but he cares about our professional pursuits.
Because if we will take the lesson that I learned at BYU to blend the sacred and the secular, he will always infuse the secular with our sacred pieces. And I learned that just in February, and so thankful for it. And to have the ability as a member of the church to use revelation in the things that um, I'm trying to do. If I close this, I would share with you five things that I learned over a 30-year time period through teachers, through friends, and through revelation that are kind of touchstones for me. The first one is make friends. Wherever you go, don't just make friends that are like you, but make friends that are not like you, that don't agree with you, that can bring a richness and a fullness to you, and because that is where we change. And it's, it's why we're here on the earth. It's where we're here to change. And our friends are the best way, I think, that we can change because they make it fun. They make it easy. It's not a painful experience most of the time. The second thing is to talk about what we learn and write it down and share our faith and our passion. As I go back to those teachers that so influenced me, it wasn't about the curriculum. It was about how they felt about their subjects. And I love to be around people like that. If, if any of you know my dad, Mark Eubank, this is a man who loves faith and he loves weather. And he loves to combine those things. And he's passionate about it. He's been retired 10 years. And he still sends me a monthly update about which records were broken. And how do I love that? I love that <laughs> because of who he is. And as we share the things that are important to us, the share the things that we learn, it's a way of sharing our faith with people that are in our faith, outside of our faith, but we share the, the feeling and the passion of what matters to us, and that influences change on the planet. I say this because, boy, it's my experience since I've been 15 years old. Forget about all the things that you are too stupid to do. We are all too stupid to do so many things. But just focus on the things that you can do, the things that are in front of you that you are able to do. That's enough. There is plenty to do there. And I, I, I have learned as an adult, don't be angst ridden about the things that you aren't able to do or that you don't feel comfortable doing. Just try and do the things that are in front of you that the Lord has put in your circle. And there's plenty of work to do there. And there's enough. There's enough. <laughs> And I, I truly believe in this refusing to separate the sacred and the secular. Everything is one. Our doctrine teaches that. Everything can be combined <coughs> into one great whole. And that's how God looks at truth. And we have the opportunity through the restoration to look at more truth in a circle. And the greatest thing, I was just talking to Matt Christensen about his new book of harmonizing and making one readable story all the accounts of the first vision. And isn't that a great thing to do? Blending an academic study with the first vision and see what new insights come out of that. We have those opportunities to do all the time. And by my real experience is everything is one and the Lord will show us the, the shading and the, the nuances of that when we combine new things. And the last thing is easy. It's to seek revelation in every aspect of a professional and a personal life. This is a great gift to us, and we don't take advantage of revelation as much as we could. I think God is anxious to teach us through any means that we will use. And uh, if we become good at hearing the revelation or knowing what it feels like, and it will even make mundane spaces like my apartment sacred to us, and mundane phrases in the scriptures or in literature become lit up bright for us because of what they mean. And I will never sing Lead Kindly Light without thinking of how it felt to me the first time. It turned out for me, I didn't know it, but the, the motto, the unofficial motto of BYU, of enter to learn, go forth to serve, that actually turned out to be true in my life. And how thankful I am for the privilege of attending this university, for the means from my family uh, that made it possible for me to come, and for the great things that poured into a very awkward young woman's heart that have helped me throughout my career. So I, I close this by saying I hope you've had the same experiences. As I stand here and I look at your faces, I can see that you have echoes of these same things. And I hope that you will take the challenge to share those things with others and lift up students because there are, I promise you, 
in the 26,000 students on this campus and, and the people in our own circles, people who are lost, who don't know their way, and who need somebody to just link arms with them or share something that they care about or talk about revelation. And uh, that's something that we can do for each other. It's what we do as brothers and sisters. It's my favorite part of the gospel. But all of us as givers and receivers, and it's blessed my life. And I thank you for this chance to be here today and for your attendance. Thank you very much. questions that you would like to ask. Could you talk about the relationship between Yale Gift Charity and um, the Missionary Department and, and uh, humanitarian missionaries? Sure. Um, there, are, there are lots of different kinds of missions to serve, and one of those serv uh, missions is called a welfare services missionary. And welfare, I think there are 86 or 92, I can't remember the total count right now. These are senior couples who are assigned through the missionary department by putting in your regular papers, and they are serving welfare services missions. And as part of that, they do humanitarian work. They may be teaching addiction recovery courses. They'll, they're meeting with um, charitable organizations. They're working on water or wheelchairs. They're providing logistical support to some of the humanitarian projects that we do. They're scattered in around 60 countries, and uh, it's a full-time mission. Did that answer the question? We've tried to structure the program so that if you are um, good with relationships and if you're good with detail and following through, you have the skills that are necessary to help with those. And then because there's a technical aspect to the project, we will assign, it's a different kind of a missionary, it's, a, it's somebody who lives at home, but they may be a doctor or a water engineer. I just met Dr. Ray Graham on campus, and he has been an, uh, acquiring English as a second language technical specialist for us. So we use people with technical specialties to advise the projects so that the missionaries on the ground don't have to have the technical expertise, but they have somebody. Over here. Yes. That is a very good question. So the question is, since we were ratified as a charitable organization under the umbrella of the UN, what have we done since that time to, to contribute toward their mission and toward good? I'll answer it in two ways. The UN in the past has been very leery of faith-based organizations because their, their preconceived idea was that faith-based groups have a different agenda that is about their faith and not so much about charity. So there's been a lot of skepticism. But the General Secretary Ban Ki-moon said, there is so much work, good, credible work being done by faith-based organizations, we have to open up some space for that. And so during his time, they have. And so LDS Charities came as about that. And so as a result of our membership, we are now interacting with other faith-based groups that are doing very credible work. So uh, uh, the, the Lutheran World Service, Catholic Relief Services, Islamic Relief, the Baha'i Organization, it's the Seventh-day Adventists. We are all in the same councils. And so as we sit, in fact, nobody knows this, but one of the next uh, side events that we will do at the UN is to sit with our UN faith-based partners and talk about the work that is done through faith. So I appreciate that question. <coughs> yes. Are you specifically thinking about Ebola? There was that beautiful article yesterday about Sierra Leone and what the church is doing to help, and I just can't wait to hear more of those kinds of things. I'm just looking for some water. Ebola is, you know, it's scary for us. We all read what's happening in Dallas, but for what is happening in uh, parts of West Africa, it's, it's as if it's the Middle Ages and the, and the plague is happening. There is so much hysteria around it, and it's so communicable that it's so difficult. And so I, I read in the paper a couple days ago that the transport minister 
has isolated himself because his driver died, and the head doctor has isolated himself because his secretary died. It's touching every single family. The church is providing, one of the biggest problems is nobody's producing any food. And so even people who aren't affected are suffering because there's no transportation into the capital. People aren't going out to tend their crops. So the church is partnering with the World Food Program to just provide basic food and to get it transported where it needs to go. We're also uh, partnering with the International Medical Corps to get the, the suits, the gloves, that all of the protective clothing so that the medical professionals who are literally putting their lives on the line and hundreds of them have died would have a chance at being more protected. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Yes? Nobody's ever asked me that before. It's a great question. <laughs> I'll just admit that some of my experiences have given me a little bit of post-traumatic stress. There are things that you know I have seen and others have seen that are just so difficult, and they, they, they don't leave you. They stay with you. But um, I had a, a boss who said every day, I think about ISIS, I think about Ebola, you know, I think about all of these things, and what we're trying to do is such a small drop in the bucket. But I, I take a lot of comfort in knowing that Heavenly Father is aware of all those things, and Jesus Christ is aware of those, and they actually are at the head of this. It's their work, and they're allowing us to help, and they give us certain assignments. But in places where we can't go or we haven't been effective, they take that on their backs. And I don't have to bear this work on my back. It's born on, on, on the back of Jesus Christ. And maybe that sounds cliche, but I, I feel the power of that to me because I couldn't take it. I couldn't take the pressure on my back. In perhaps the least quoted of all New Testament epistles, uh, St. Jude, there is a phrase that says, some have compassion making a difference. And uh, Sister Eubank, we're grateful for your example. Thank you. Uh, and for your instructions to us on how we can uh, go forth and, and uh, do likewise. Thank you to all of you for attending, and let's conclude with a round of applause.